Afghanistan is well known for its imposing mountainous terrain and how difficult it has been to subdue by foreign occupiers. For this, it has earned the epithet Graveyard of Empires. For the last four decades of its history, the country has been engulfed in relentless conflict and war. In trying to find a cause for this perpetual violence, one typically goes back to the Afghan-Soviet War of the 1980s, where the Mujahideen rose up against the unpopular communist government. In truth, however, the roots of its woes can be traced even further back, back to post-1950s Afghanistan, a period that has ironically been portrayed as a golden age of stability and peace in the country's history. But it was also a time of great political agitation and developments unfolded in a way that set Afghanistan on the road to war. In the years after World War II, the Afghan political elite decided on a course of rapid economic and political change to its society. This course was taken as a matter of necessity rather than ideological conviction. The country's monarchic political order was conservative, but understood that in order to survive in a modern world, they had to modernize. At the same time, these changes have to be understood within the wider scope of contemporary international affairs. The Cold War between the United States of America and the Soviet Union was the most important geopolitical issue from the end of World War II in 1945 to the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. In this time period, the two superpowers used both soft and hard power to persuade nations to be aligned with them. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Afghanistan's monarchical government took advantage of this precarious situation by essentially playing off the two superpowers against each other in a bid to get more developmental aid. Both the Americans and the Soviets promised the Afghans help in modernizing projects. For instance, the USA built a dam in Helmand during the 1950s and 60s which aimed to instrumentalize the Helmand River's capacity to generate energy. Whilst the Soviets in 1955 rolled out $100 million in credit that would facilitate Soviet engineers to construct factories, dams, airports, and highways. Another aspect of the Afghan government's desire to modernize was to send young university students out to countries like the Soviet Union and America to gain knowledge that the students could then bring back and use for the progress of Afghanistan. Herein lays a key causal effect of the eventual Soviet-Afghan war. After World War II, there were certain strands of Afghan society, especially within the university students and army officers, who were familiarizing themselves with divergent strands of ideological thought, such as liberalism and communism. The communist students and army officers who traveled abroad to the Soviet Union for training would ferment greater ties with the communist superpower, and in time, these close ties would serve them once the communists gained power inside Afghanistan. In addition, in 1965, Nur Muhammad Tarakay, along with Babrak Karmal and others, set up the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, or the PDPA, a Marxist-Leninist political party that presented their political outlook within the framework of a class struggle. The PDPA soon fractured into two main factions, Khalq being the more radical one, and Parcham being known as the more moderate of the two. It should be mentioned that these political developments took place within the backdrop of what's known as the Constitutional Decade, 
a period lasting from 1964 to 1973 that was characterized by a move towards democracy. Whilst it brought about a multi-party system and a free press, the constitutional decade brought its fair share of political chaos as well. This, coupled with ecological disasters, forced the scholar Louis Dupree to prophetically state in 1971 that revolution would seem no more than a decade away. Within five years, the first abortive coup may occur. Most likely, it will emanate from the idealistic, unrealistic left. In 1973, Whilst the king, Zahir Shah, was away on medical treatment in Italy, his cousin and ex-prime minister, Muhammad Dawood Khan, staged a bloodless coup that toppled the monarchy and replaced it with a republic that had him at its helm. In doing this, he was helped by the communist PDPA and their Soviet-trained military officers who had infiltrated the government and army. This alliance was viewed very negatively by the increasingly outspoken Islamist activists who were ideologically antagonistic to communism. In addition to this, Daoud Khan reignited a rivalry with Pakistan that was largely focused on his irredentist desires to reclaim territories lost to the British in 1893 which was subsequently inherited by Pakistan upon its creation in 1947. These territories within Pakistan were inhabited by the Pashtun ethnic group, the dominant ethnic group in Afghanistan politically and demographically. In response to President Dawood's subversive activities within Pakistan, the ISI, the Inter and Islamist Uprising in 1975 that was put down by the Afghan government. In time, Dawood's coalition with the communists disintegrated to devastating consequences. In 1977, he proclaimed a new constitution and called a new cabinet which was devoid of appointments for members of the two factions of the PDPA, Khalq and Parcham. In fact, he actively sought out to minimize the influence of communist members that had helped him in his 1973 coup. But the Khalqis and Parchamis had a solid power base amongst army officers and had helped their cause by unifying the two factions in 1977. By 1978, Dawood had left himself in a position where he had no power base and was opposed by a wide array of forces that ranged from Islamic fundamentalists to liberal university students. This provided the perfect opportunity for the communists to overthrow him. And so in April 1978, the PDPA launched the Saur Revolution, in which Dawood, along with his family, lost their lives and a communist state was established in Afghanistan. The PDPA, under the leadership of the Khalqist Nur Muhammad Tarakay, immediately set about to bring widespread changes to Afghan society. These changes, such as land reforms and the emancipation of women, were intended to rapidly modernize Afghan society, something which other Afghan rulers had tried to do in the 20th century, such as King Amanullah in the 1920s. But the PDPA went even further, attacking practices and traditions which they viewed as feudal. This antagonistic approach to certain elements of tradition was extended to Islam as well. The PDPA's outlook seemed to be rooted in a desire to vindicate the famous Marxist statement, religion is the opium of the masses. The socio-cultural makeup of Afghanistan meant that the new leadership was on a collision course with the majority of its citizens. Ordinary Afghans resented and resisted what they viewed as a forced attempt to change their identity, especially since it required them to sever connections with the most important element of their culture, Islam. Throughout the countryside, 
more and more families were migrating to Iran and Pakistan, whilst an Islamist rebel movement in the form of the Mujahideen was growing in strength, undoubtedly helped by the significant number of defecting army soldiers. The Mujahideen meant those who engage in jihad or holy struggle, and they portrayed themselves as being the opponents of the quote-unquote un-Islamic communists. The general discontent with the PDPA only served to fuel the cause of the Mujahideen. There were several spontaneous uprisings around the country, the most famous of which took place in the city of Herat in March 1979, where a popular uprising with the support of mutinying army soldiers took control of one of the most important cities in the country. The communist government's response was ruthless. Thousands were killed as they reclaimed control over the city. The rising strength of anti-government forces, as well as the bad decisions made by the PDPA, worried the Soviet Union, the key ally of the Afghan communists. In September 1979, there was a power struggle within the Khalq faction and President Tarakay was removed from power and later executed by his successor, Hafizullah Amin. Amin's relationship with the USSR was rapidly deteriorating, thanks largely to mutual distrust. By December, the Soviets had to make a decision to get directly involved and stabilize the situation in favor of their allies or risk letting the communist government collapse. It should be stated that the Soviets did not want to intervene directly in Afghanistan. They demonstrated that repeatedly throughout 1978 and 1979, when even though the PDPA asked for direct military help, the Soviets refused. The two sides had actually signed a friendship treaty in December 1978, which allowed the Afghan communist government to call on the Soviets for military help. But Afghanistan was not of major international importance to the USSR, and it was obvious that the conservative country would be hostile to their military presence. What ended up changing their mind is not known for sure. One can only speculate. The Iranian revolution that had happened earlier in 1979 would justifiably have given the Soviet leadership cause for concern for their own internal stability. The Soviet Union had a number of Muslim republics in Central Asia under its control at the time. Therefore, an Islamist Iranian revolution in conjunction with a rising Islamist movement in Afghanistan under the Mujahideen would not have bode well for the peace of mind of Soviet policy makers. In this time, the Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev, had been suffering from a variety of ailments, meaning that by the late 1970s, he was helped significantly by the trio of Yuri Andropov, Dmitry Ustinov, and Andrei Gromyko. In December 1979, the Soviet leadership decided upon a short intervention in Afghanistan that would stabilize the government, partly by replacing President Amin with the more moderate Parchami Babrak Karmal. A key failure of the Soviets in their decision-making process was in the way that they viewed Afghanistan. To the Soviet higher-ups, Afghanistan was only seen in the context of the Cold War. This meant that they largely viewed the Mujahideen uprising against the PDPA as being something that was stoked and sponsored by their Cold War rivals, the Americans. This strategic lack of insight would prove fatal for the Soviets, as they failed to understand that the majority of Afghans were actually against the ideas and policies of the PDPA. And it was this, not American encouragement, that gave rise to the Mujahideen. Bearing this in mind will help us understand why Afghanistan is referred to as the Soviet Union's Vietnam.